all uh, two announcements relative to the changes of the program. Um, there was a talk uh, of Robert Parrish that was planned for this afternoon. He had to cancel at the last uh, at the last moment. Uh, and uh, there um, also the program of tomorrow will change. We'll actually start at nine instead of 9.50, because the talk of uh, Ivano Tavernelli would be, would be tomorrow, starting at 9. And probably I will shift, uh, if you don't mind, the, the <clears throat> Thursday uh, session. we we'll start at 9.50, since we'll have four talks on, on Thursday. Uh, it's someone else. Uh, I, I was just I was just mentioning for who just arrived that tomorrow we will start at 9:50. Uh, sorry, it was tomorrow we will start at nine because the talk of Ivano Tavernelli will be at nine, and on Thursday, since we have only uh, four talks, we will start at 9:50. Um, so the the session of this afternoon is focused on uh, materials, and uh, the first uh, the first talk uh, by Ivan uh, Runger is uh, on uh, the Green's function algorithms for uh, for quantum computers. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Here is a very nice conference. Uh, very good discussions until now. Uh, and yes, today I will present our work on, on, on Green's functions uh, and our work on algorithms uh, on quantum computers. Uh, but let me just thank uh, the rewards so at, at MPL with me, mainly Francois Jamin and Abhishek Agarwal that helped developing these algorithms. Uh, and then actually worked with Continuum uh, for some of this work with a company called Raco, which some of you may know, but now it's included in Odyssey Therapeutics. So they have been uh, acquired by a bigger company. Uh, University of Maryland, where I did some experiments and then in King's College London and, and UCL, uh, we had some collaborations with Cedric Weber's group and George Booth and also then Don. Um, yeah, so to, to, this is quantum computing for chemistry for big molecules like this is, has been so, sort of uh, established, uh, investigated quite a lot. And the vision is to get, say, to get accurate energies, excitation energies, dynamics eventually. Um, so that's, that's where I guess we all want to be. But the reality on hardware is that we are restricted to something like small molecules. Um, water molecule, some chain of hydrogen atoms. So you, you have a few atoms basically in, 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 on actual hardware. And maybe this just to set the scene where we are and where we want to be, right? And, and I think um, it's important because what, what we will discuss today is material science, right? So now you have a lot of systems with hundreds of atoms, periodic systems. Um, and, and the applications we're looking at is quantum transport, or organic electronics, light harvesting. and we are, yes, we want the energy, but also things like conductance, lifetime, and photo excitation, and so on. I think here, Green's functions are a very natural tool to compute these quantities. But also what maybe can be useful for us is that often only qualitative agreement with the experiment is already challenging with many classical methods. So we're not looking for the ultimate precision. I mean, it depends on the system, but sometimes you just want some qualitative features to be reproduced. And so this may help us in terms of, well, if there's noise on the hardware, maybe that can help that it can still give us good enough results. Um, and uh, so first we want to identify, you know, we have condensed matter physics, right? We want to identify, so when I started working on this, we, we thought, well, you know, these are calculations we did over the last couple of years. Why would I need a quantum computer for any of this? And uh, well, it, it turns out that we have a lot of systems where DFT is perfectly fine, right? Density functional theory. And yes, you, people are trying to get density functional theory in a quantum computer, but that will be very challenging because it's already very efficient. So to make it even more efficient on a quantum computer is gonna be very difficult. Um, but there are many other problems where you have say magnetic thin films or say low temperature condo physics, like in this case, for example, uh, measure the conductance through this molecule. What you find is at very low voltage, you have a peak the so-called condo peak. And if you do a nice DFT calculations, you get almost like a constant conductance in the system. But we know that we can solve this and the way to do it is to, to treat some orbitals on the molecule as an Anderson impurity, and then you get a nice condo peak out of this. Um, so 
Now, the thing is, uh, the problem is that solving this under, so, and, and as I said, you need to use an Anderson impurity model to solve this, but to solve it is very computationally expensive. So only very small systems can be solved. And hence, our motivation was, well, quantum computers may allow to overcome this limitation, right? We don't know whether they will eventually, but that's definitely a potential uh, route for quantum advantage. So that, that's the motivation that these are the systems we're gonna look at. Um, and, and so the system that I showed, if you remember that the STM tip, the molecule and the substrate is like an embedding setup, right? This could be the STM tip, this could be the molecule, this is the substrate. And so in the quantum transport community, the embedding method is a very natural uh, thing because you always need to have uh, sort of embedded uh, um, uh, metallic electrodes where your current can flow in and out. Um, and that we showed how, uh, how our sort of Anderson impurity model, and then, uh, you know, that's for the single impurity, but if you have a periodic system, that's basically going to be used within dynamical mean field theory. So just illustrate the basic equations, which, uh, I mean, have been uh, derived a long time ago. So the Anderson impurity Hamiltonian is this, you have a, um, the onsite energy of the bath, so you have all um, these orbitals here filled up to, to the Fermi energy and it's non-interacting. Uh, then you have the onset energy of your molecule of, of impurity that where you can put one electron. And then you have the interaction energy that if you put the second electron, you pay the price U, right? So that's usually above the Fermi energy. Um, and, and that is fine. That, that's basically captured, say, in a mean field DFT calculation. You can get the occupied peak and the empty state separated by U by using just DFT plus U, say. But the key bit is this fluctuation term where electrons can hop in and out from the molecule to the electrodes, where now <clears throat> what can happen, kind of intuitively on a very short time scale, the electron can uh, briefly hop out to the Fermi energy and then be immediately or very quickly replenished by another electron. And, and these, very, uh, these are very low energy fluctuations, which you cannot capture on the mean field level, right? And, and in fact, these are the origin of this additional condo peak at the Fermi energy, which you cannot capture uh, in mean field. Right, the, the, the true solution, this, this is perfectly fine in the FT plus two, right? The occupied state, the empty state, but the condo peak uh, is absent. But we want obviously to simulate it. And, and so the question is how to do it. Um, and uh, so now we have to solve this Anderson impurity Hamiltonian. Um, and, and there's many ways to do it. I'll just describe here the exact analyzation method because it's very, a very natural way to get it to the quantum computer. So what you do is the approximation that you do is that you, you replace your actual bath, which is infinitely large, with a finite number of effective orbitals, just fictitious atoms. They are not like gold atoms, they're just fictitious atoms. And to each of these atoms, you give some onset energies and some hopping elements with your impurity, and that defines your system. Um, and then in principle, at least on paper, you can solve this. Uh, you, you can calculate the Green's function. I mean. Just remind us that the Green's function, once you have that, you get a lot of these properties like that that we want to extract from the system. Uh, it's just a sum over uh, this sum goes all the, all the states or you remove one electron from the system. So you have excited state, you have removed an electron. This sum goes where you have added an electron to the system. Uh, and then uh, the coefficients are very simply just uh, some poles at, at frequencies omega h n, which are the excitation energies. Um, so to calculate this Green's function, all you need to calculate is basically all the eigenvalues of, of your excited, first excited states. Eh? Um, and then you get the Green's function. Then you have also these, these amplitudes here that tells you how high the peak in a sense in, in, your, in your Green's function. And schematically, I, I show it here as a, as a loop. You have your input parameters, epsilon and so on. And then you call the Anderson impurity solver, which is the difficult part. In this case, is calculate the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian and its eigenvectors. And then you can calculate uh, all you for this equation. So all the omegas, all the lambdas, and you plug it into this equation and you get the Green's function. So it, again, as I said on paper, it's very simple to write down and you can get the exact solution. Um, but the problem, as we know, is that H, the size of H state exponentially as you include more bad sides. So that's why in practice, we cannot do exact analysis for like you know, a thousand hours. Yeah. You can do approximations, but uh, you know, if you solve it, say really brute force, you can't do very big systems. Um, so the question is, can the quantum computer help here? And uh, maybe just a slight detour now, uh, let's now go to dynamical mean field theory. It, it's the same. What you do is you have a periodic repetition of, of interacting impurities 
But the trick you do basically is you pick out one of them and you call that your Anderson impurity. And you'd say everybody else is just a bar. Uh, and you solve it exactly the same way as before, with the only difference that at the beginning, you don't know the properties of the bath, right? So you need to, you need to start with a guess for your parameters. And then you, you, you calculate the whole machinery and then you set equal, in a sense, the bath properties based on, on your solution here. And then you do so until you reach self consistency. But, but this DMFT loop is not, in a sense, a complication. The complication is still the Anderson impurity problem, which, which needs to be solved. Um, and so how do you do it on a quantum computer? I mean, this just schematically show you, you when you put your Anderson impurity solver, you use some quantum circuit of some form to, to solve that. That's basically how you do it. And I mean, there's <laughs> two main approaches to this. You can use time evolution, like trotter expansions of some sort. But the problem with those is that they're very susceptible to noise. Um, and so what we have proposed in our articles is some alternative methods that, that I will present now. Um, yeah, so, so this is what we're going to talk today. So we, we, again, we want to do these real systems. Uh, we, we map it to an exact generalization with some finite number of orbitals. Um, but our aim was to have a system that we can actually run on hardware. And this was a couple of years ago. Uh, and then we said, well, let's simplify it to the smallest possible. We have one impurity side. And only one bath site. I mean, you can't make it smaller than this. Um, and we wanted to see can this actually, can we have any sort of algorithm, maybe not scalable, but any algorithm that can run on hardware, that can live with the noise that we have. And so that's that's what I will show on this slide, just a very brief that the algorithm itself. So um, I said we do two side MFT. We need to calculate this Green's function using this Lehman representation. Um, and the good thing about two side MFT, okay, also in the particle hole symmetric uh, limit, is that you need only three parameters. So, in, in all this sum here, you only need two omegas here and one lambda, because everything else you can then obtain from that. And how do we do that? So, how do we get this Green's function? Right? That's the question. Now, the first thing is that we have to, to write the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of Pauli operators, and we use a Jordan Wigner transformation. And you can recognize here from for uh, the electron electron interaction, the U term. And here the V is the hopping. So this is where you electron hops from one side to the other one, right? So it has the ingredients uh, that, that we need. Um, and, then, and then comes the how do we actually solve it? Well, the first step in all of this, you always need the ground state energy. So no matter if you do time evolution or anything, you always need the ground state first. There's no way around that. And the way we do it is using a very short quantum algorithm, which is kind of schematically in it. So I'm summarized here. We take your Hamiltonian, you represent your wave function with a parameterized circuit on your quantum computer, depending on these parameters, theta. And then you evaluate the energy for the theta, and then you minimize it until you get the ground state energy. So this is just a normal VQE. So we have the first ingredient. Um, now we need these two omegas. And as I said, the equations are this one, you need the energy of three electron ground state, and then you take the difference to the actual ground state. And the second omega is the energy of the three electron first excited state and the, energy, and the difference to the, to the ground state. Um, now, how do we calculate this excited state energy? And that, there's many ways to do that, but what we did here in this paper is, is to use a, a penalty term. So you basically still use this equation to minimize the energy, but you add a penalty term where you have a psi and psi say ground state, and you want to make sure they are orthogonal basically, so that you get the, the first orthogonal state to your actual ground state. Um, and when you have that, then uh, you can calculate the lambda, which is the last ingredient, and it's just uh, an overlap like matrix element between the two wave functions. So it's, it, it can be evaluated as well on a quantum computer. Uh, this is it, because everything that I show here can be executed on a quantum computer this bit. This gives you this bit and this bit as well, right? So it's a quantum algorithm that, that we have then run on a quantum computer and, and uh, yeah, and I will show you the results now. Um, but what I did not show, maybe just a note here on, on how do we actually parameterize that psi? And this is a big problem as shown yesterday and also in the ADAPT uh, VQE talk. Um, but the system here is small enough that you can figure out kind of how, how to get a good solution. In this case, we just use a circuit like this with some rotation and some synod gates. And it turns out that this circuit is good enough to give you the exact energy in, in theory, right? Um, and then we tested it on hardware and we got energies within, I would say, depending on the hardware, like three to 20% deviation 
uh, of the exact numbers, which we, we said, okay, that's fine. So at least we get some small errors. Um, and again, the number depends a lot. So in, on ion traps at the time, we got a little bit smaller errors on superconducting qubits, it was a bit higher. Um, what we then also did is, so these are four qubit system. Uh, you can use symmetries because you know, say the number of electrons, for example, you can reduce this to two qubits. And then we said, can we now run the full DMFT loop on the quantum computer? And the answer was yes. And I will just show the final result here that um, you basically get uh, the density of state, which is your final output in a sense of this calculation, where we have the experiment on the IBM machine is in green and the exact solution is black. And you can see that at least on this scale, uh, they're overlapping. Um, yeah, so that was the final result of this, kind of this method. And we were quite pleased because it was the first demonstration on how that the, despite the noise on IBM machines at the time, uh, it, it still managed uh, to get good results. Um, and what I would like to point out also is the qualitative aspect, right? You see the non-interacting peak is just one broad peak around zero, while the interacting solution has the three peak structure. So in that sense, even if the three peaks would not be perfect in the right position, for many applications, it's still fine, right? There's this qualitative difference from, a, from one peak to three peaks that, that even if our DFT, our, our sort of calculations would not, not be exact, you would still get this qualitative. Uh, improvement. Okay, so this was the proof of concept that we did a while ago. Um, and uh, as I said before, we, we, want to, we want to do this system here. Um, so now we, we went from there to small, and now we need to go back up again, right? And I, I'll just show you two sort of avenues that we uh, followed. You can both have quantum inspired improvements of classical methods, which I will just mention very briefly today. And then uh, the improvement of the scalability of the quantum algorithm as well. Um, so let me briefly mention a method that was inspired. So the problem was we have a quantum computer with very few qubits. And, that, and, and the number of baths that you can do is, is proportional to the number of qubits, right? So we said, well, can you get away with fewer qubits and still get a good result? And so this motivated this work that we said, well, in principle, yes, and this was really uh, motivated by Cedric Weber in, in, in King's College that came up with this method, that you, you can now, because your bath is just fictitious, you can do in a sense, to some extent, many things with your bath. And what we introduced here is just uh, interaction energies in the bath as well. And what that will do is that it gives you the bath with much many more features because having interactions give you these additional peaks and density of states. So, Three sides with interactions are very rich in terms of properties and, and are maybe the same as the eight sides uh, without interactions. Uh, yeah, there's. And you know, when you introduce the interaction in the bath, uh, of course, it gives you more parameters, but you know, we characterize everything. Mm -hmm. Normally, mm -hmm. at least if you look at the derivation mm -hmm. of DMFT, is that some type of Wick theorem applies. Of mm -hmm. course, it's justified for strong mm -hmm. interaction through whatever dimensional arguments or so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, aren't you worried that the whole self consistency loop with the Green's function mm -hmm. stops applying once you start to put interaction into the bath? Uh, it is a good question. And I, 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 basically, what you do is you need what you need to take care of. And what you, there's always a price to pay, basically. Uh, and what you need to take care of is that the self energy that you get, uh, we have an additional uh, minimization loop that you try to, to make the off diagonal elements as close to zero as possible between bath and, and self. So basically, the, the, uh, when you optimize the bath parameters, you, you have the additional loop that you, you make the self energy diagonal in a sense. And that solves some of these things. And there's another question related to this. And it's never going to be exactly zero, but that, that's the, yeah. Uh, do, do you have some problem of uh, self-energy uh, within the LDE? Because the both of them say that you need not to be written bath. Exactly. If not, stop. Yes, exactly. But, but we, we, so the interaction are just the, in terms of blocks, they, they live in the interacting site and they live in the bath. There's no cross interaction, right? Okay. 
And then when we make the self-energy, we make sure that uh, when you optimize the limit, that, 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 that the, the orthogonal terms are, are as close to zero as possible. And that uh, basically should overcome these problems. All right, and how you get them, the, 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 the interaction in the bath, how you define, how you obtain? Um, no, the, the rest is just like normal exact generalization that you basically just uh, try to make it to get the, the with the final bath sites as close as possible uh, to, to the All right, okay, shapes. it's variational somehow. It is variational, yes. And you're oh, sure it, that yeah. you have not interaction between the, 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 the system bus and the rest? You are um, sure that uh, self energy is representable? Basically, the answer is yes. Uh, we have discussed it in quite a bit of detail in the appendix. But yes, I think the key is that once you make this thing that you make the orthogonal elements of the self energy zero, then all these issues of kind of cross correlations, in a sense, they, they, they disappear. They, 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 they become small as well. Um, Okay, yeah. fine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I could present this in more detail, but I just wanted to illustrate it as a kind of quantum inspired algorithm. Um, but, but, um, but then what, what we did in that paper also is to say, well, it was motivated by, by uh, the quantum computer. So we just demonstrated on a six qubit system with, with the same algorithm I showed before with the Lehman representation uh, that you get uh, uh, you know, you can write a quantum algorithm that gives you basically the same solution as, as, the, as the normal MMD. Um, so I think this was a very nice approach that was again motivated by quantum computing. Um, but but the, the, now we come to the second question is, well, how can we improve the scalability? And, and what, what is the main problem of, of the method I showed so far? So this is the Lehman representation. Uh, again, nice, nice to write on paper, but the problem is that this M, this number M in the sum scales very badly with system size. So you have exponentially many, many elements. Now you can try to cut, right? That, that's, you can try to look at just features in some range. Um, but uh, we think the most elegant method to overcome this uh, problem is, is to use the preload basis because I mean, that's just used classically, right? In, in classically, this is basically how you, how you solve this system <clears throat> that you don't use the excited states naively as your basis, but the, the preload basis, which has some information of the excited states, but the nice thing in practice is that they don't scale exponentially. And in practice, again, it's typically limited you know, to, to some size that you can eventually truncate. Um, so that's the motivation why we use the preload states. And uh, this slide just, just shows it well within the Langshaw's method for Green's function. Right? You, you have the zero temporary for Green's function, which can be written as the sum of the greater and the lesser one. And then there are basically matrix elements of the ground state with say a creation operator and then the Hamiltonian, the inverse of the Hamiltonian in the middle. Um, and, and so what the Langshaw's does is it's a basis transformation that makes the Hamiltonian diagonal, three diagonal like this. And then you can get the Green's function at the, uh, this one here uh, by just a continuous fraction representation. Uh, it's well established and, and well used. So what, what we want to do is to express this on a quantum computer. Um, and so I give just br briefly how, how uh, the alpha and the betas are calculated in the Green's function. So you, 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 the, these are the Krilov states. So you start with the first Krilov state is just uh, some creation operator on the ground state. So again, we always need the ground state, right? Because it's, so the ground states in chemistry often may want the total energy. That's for us in a sense, just the starting point of all this. Um, and then, and then you construct the next field of states iteratively by applying essentially the Hamiltonian on the previous field of states with some orthogonality conditions. Um, and then the coefficients, once you construct this base, are simply given by expectation values of the Hamiltonian and expectation values of the Hamiltonian square. So this can all be calculated on a quantum computer. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, as I mentioned before, problem classically is that this method still, still scales exponentially with system size. We are still limited in the size. And the idea here is to construct this using a quantum computer. Um, so let me now maybe just summarize the, from the beginning to end what we are doing here. So we first uh, use, take our system of interest, interest, lantern and copper oxide in this case. Um, and then we say, well, uh, we use DFT for this and, and, and usually it works fine. But in this case, it turns out that there are some orbitals, the copper oxide plane, that, that, that cannot be treated at that level of theory. And, and so um, there's, there are strong correlations where these perturbative sort of methods fail. And then you map that uh, to, a, to Hubbard Hamiltonian. 
uh, with some effective parameters U and T that basically those you extract from the DFT or QSGW calculation. Um, that's the first step that we did. And then, and then you use the MFT, right? where we use the Anderson impurity model with a bath and the impurity, and we do the self-consistency cycle to, to solve the system. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, this is all done on a conventional, so a lot of the calculation is done on a conventional computer, but just this last little bit of the Anderson impurity model is done on the, on the quantum computer. And, and how do we do that? Um, so this is the flowchart of the quantum bit, but we want to solve the Anderson impurity model. We map it to exact regularization. Then we need, need to get the ground state, uh, which is tricky. And then once we have the ground state, we need to compute all the Krilov states because that gives us the Green's function then with these recursive, like, uh, yeah, these get recursive relations. Um, that's the method in a, in a nutshell. Um, and what I will show now is two sort of implementations of this method. One, which we call the Krilo variation quantum algorithm, which as the name said, uses a variation algorithm. And the second one is the quantum subspace expansion for Green's functions, which as the name says, uses quantum subspace expansion. Um, so then I will show some results with this. Um, let me just briefly, without going to the details, explain what, how we do it in the Krilo method. Uh, it just uses BQA uh, to get the ground state energy. So I write one term here. So the energy is the only term in your cost function that you minimize. Now, to get the Krilov states, you need to minimize three terms in the cost function. There's a modified cost function. One is not an energy, but it's, some, it's, it's one matrix element, say, of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then there's two other terms that are orthogonality terms to the previous two uh, Krilov states. But the good thing is, compared to the Langshu, the, the previous method, is that this is always three. It, even if I use 100 uh, Krilov states, this will always be just three terms in my, in my expansion. So in that sense, it's scalable. And I will just show you the results now. And we apply this to the lanthanum copper oxide system. Uh, just briefly illustrated here, you have the density of states where um, DFT and GW give you essentially a metal. So there's a finite density of states around the Fermi energy. But experimentally, we know it should be insulating. Um, and then we do the DMFT for this. With, with what we do here is one impurity and three bath sites, so is about eight qubits. Uh, and, and the, the result is shown here that uh, the colors are a bit difficult to see, but essentially the green and the blue curve is the uh, quantum algorithm and the conventional simulation. As you see, they're more or less overlapping, except in some energy range away from the Fermi energy. So, and, and the reason actually, when you do the DMFT cell consistency, very tiny deviations can lead to this sort of shift. But basically it shows that it works. And we also compare it with, um, uh, when you use 11 bath sets, which was the biggest we could do at least on our machine there. Uh, and, and even when you use 11 bath side, sure, it's more accurate, but it's not as if it changes much, which again brings me back to these qualitative aspects that sometimes you, you can get away here with quite uh, approximations and you don't care exactly if the gap is, you know, one value or um, for many times, it, it, it depends on, on what experiments you compare it to. Uh, so this was also nice uh, because it was at least for us, the, well, it was the first time we could do it on, on for real materials. Um, but one question actually came up with, well, is this to some extent resilient to the noise? And uh, so basically what we did is we added a noise model to the simulations. And, and what we needed to change the algorithm quite a bit for that. Like the algorithm is still the same, but the way we compute exactly quantities, we needed to make the circuit depth as small as possible, basically. But then uh, with reasonable noise, so this 10 to the minus three in, in our sort of depolarizing noise, um, we get uh, results that are, you know, the, the, um, it's slightly offset from the exact solution. Right? You start to see the deviation. If you go to 10 to the minus four, it's, it's basically the exact solution. So I think the bottom line here is that if you do want these functions uh, and all these quantities, you, you will have to have a low level of noise. I think there is no way around that. But the good thing is we quantified that it's a number that is within reason on, on sort of current or, or, or near term hardware. Yeah. When you did this, this is a uh, little mm -hmm. noise, one yeah. computer. Mm -hmm. um, and the type of modeling is some kind of mm -hmm. 
operators during your during your days? No, here we use. So, so no, you know, if you would make a mass equation simulation, I would assume that still it's super smooth because it's completely averaged. Um, every peak here, okay, yeah. the, the, this this in a sense is is not noise as such as a peak in the density of states. Okay. I guess it depends on the broadening that you use. So we we ah, okay. Actually, so these peaks are this is the full machinery, right? So uh -huh. a lot of these peaks would come from say lantanum states or other. Ah, states. okay, I see, see, see. So it's it's the back projected DOS. Uh, yeah, so this okay. this is what you would call noisy. Yeah, it looks noisy, but it's just uh, um, okay. Yeah. No, I okay, get it. Uh, okay, I see, see, see. Then I misinterpreted what I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um. So. So the idea here is that because the variation algorithm, it I, with with moderate depths, but again, we we did have to improve the algorithm quite a bit, like improving in a sense, making compromises, right? When you have a state vector, you can make it very long, the circuit, and you get very accurate results. Here we said, let's make it a bit shorter, let's get worse results, but then more resilient to noise. So, so we, we managed at the end to get, I think, quite, quite good agreement. Uh, and then in the last part uh, of the talk, um, I will talk in a, well, now about, about the second uh, way to do it is using quantum subspace expansion uh, to get the Green's function. Um, so, so why, why, why do we bother? I mean, the method that I showed before in principle works, but the problem with VQAs, as discussed many times, is it's a bit difficult to know how they scale. Um, and we have this recent review article that we discussed it in, in, at great length. Um, it's it's possible, but again, you know, people may find solutions to say the Baron protocol problems and other things. But it would be good to have a method that is more kind of clear how it will scale. And well, the method that is clear that will scale is, is, is what I would call brute force time evolution with Chotter expansion. So. But the Chotter expansion for these sort of systems is way out of, it will, you know, what I showed you before, you would never get with, with the noise model. It's just, it would just give you random numbers. So it's, it's, it's unfeasible for any of the reasonable noise, noise devices. And so this motivated this, that we said, okay, let's still use our advantage of the Krilov basis, which we think is a good basis, Let's merge it with time evolution because that allows for scalability. But let's try to get a moderate circuit depth. But those are the three kind of ingredients um, that I, I will show uh, what we can do with that. Um, now, what is quantum subspace expansion? So that was invented by others. And it, it, there's a number of papers in the last couple of years that have basically used that concept. Uh, it has different names, as you see here, but it's always the same thing. Uh, and, and, and what it is, is that you, you you just like we are used to doing in, in, in the notal binding all the calculations, you, you express your ground say there's a linear combination of some basis orbitals. I mean, that, that's all there is to the quantum subspace expansion. Um, and then the Hamiltonian, again, I mean, if applied to the, this ground state, it needs to give you the ground state energy as, as an eigenvalue of this state. Um, <clears throat> and so what you compute on a quantum computer is, well, this phi i you can represent on the quantum computer. You, you calculate the sort of matrix elements of the Hamiltonian between the basis function, and then also the overlap matrix element. I mean, these are also not straightforward. And, and the question is, if you want them very accurately, how, how good it works when you scale. But in principle, this is something that can be done on a quantum computer. Um, and then when you have that, well, these are just matrices now. And then you just solve this linear system of equation to get your, say, ground state energy and also the wave function. Um, so, so that's the method, and um, and that has been used, uh, I mean, quite a lot for the ground state. And what? Uh, well, let me just compare it to VQE. Maybe some advantages and disadvantages. So VQE, you prepare your whole psi on the quantum computer with some unitary, right? This is your quantum circuit with the parameter theta. You 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 get the energy of this, and then you update theta until you minimize the energy. Now, it, it's probably NISC friendly because it can live with a bit of noise, as we have also, many have shown, including us. Um, but the problem is the optimization of the angles becomes very difficult as you scale up. And, and you need to, to, to choose a good answer, which is just tricky. Um, now, the quantum subspace expansion is uh, you expand psi in this way, as I showed before, right? as a linear combination of basis function. You calculate only the matrix elements, and then you solve everything on a, on a conventional computer. So the parameter optimization is replaced with an eigenvalue problem. So you solve essentially all these optimizations, these issues are gone, basically. Um, 
But what is the price that you pay? Uh, it's definitely less NIST friendly because to get these things accurately, well, you need them accurately, so it's, it's, it can't live with that much noise. Um, you don't have the wave function on the quantum computer. You just have this basis function. This is just a virtual object in a sense, right? Uh, that you have, so you don't have it on a quantum computer. And, um, and a lot of, I mean, depending on the system size, you may need a lot of these elements. So that's for the, now the good thing about that is this trivially parallel. So you can get a lot of elements if you have a thousand qubits or a million qubits, eventually you can parallelize this very efficiently. You say that it's an not directly expressed on the quantum computer um, because we want to do a lot of post processing with the wave function, and if you have it on the quantum computer, it's just nice. If you don't, you have this additional sum in front that adds an overhead to the computation. So I do think, um, yeah, I mean it is debatable maybe, but I think it's a negative because I would like to have the actual wave function on the quantum computer because. Right. Well, this is this, yeah. I mean, this maybe is debatable whether it's negative, but I think it's a negative because um, I mean, here you have your actual psi on the quantum computer. And it's, um, so, and, and but this is this is literature, but this is not nothing new, it's just like how I would judge the two methods. Um, and now, what we have done is we have a quantum subspace expansion for the Krilov basis of the Green's function. Now, this is in a nutshell here. So this is the kind of iterative relations for the BN and AN coefficients. And these are my Krilov states, right? Remember, these are the H applied to the previous Krilov states with orthogonality constraints. Uh, and all we do is we apply, we, we, we express the high N as a function of basis functions. And now we call them psi just to distinguish them um, from the phi for the, because they, they are different, right? Y your basis function should be as close as possible to your target state. So, and, and because the, um, the first Krilov state is a, is a creation operator applied on the ground state. The, the ground state wave basis function wouldn't be suitable for this because you need to apply the creation operator. Uh, but they can be expressed starting from the ground state, as, as we show in the paper. Um, but the problem, and, and this is one problem, if, if the ground state is expressed uh, as a linear combination of states, it adds an overhead of having the additional sum. In, in everything you do, you have this additional sum that you have to. So it takes longer, basically, the calculation. Um, but, but anyway, you can do that. And then, and then you just plug in this thing up here and then you get some uh, linear algebra equations. Now H are now matrices, H psi and S psi. And they're just given by these relations. Again, the, the matrix element of the Hamiltonian with the psi now, and, and this is for the overlap. And, I mean, just for these psi's are not the same as for the ground. So right? they're different, different uh, basis functions. In a sense, you can imagine the ground set can be a two electron wave function. And this could be a three electron wave function because they've added to the C dagger in front. Um, and that's it. And then, but we do the same. We saw this on a conventional computer, right? We just go from, then it's trivial. You just do n to n plus one on, on the classical computer. And this is on the quantum computer. Um, now, I mean, just I mean, how, how much time do I still have just to get an idea? If I have to, uh, <laughs> uh, about five minutes. Ah, that's, yeah, that's really okay. So, um, and, and, and well, okay, I said I have my, my, my basis psi or phi. How do we get that? And again, this is from the literature. A good way to get the basis is to just take an initial state, which needs to have some overlap with your ground state. I mean, as, as much as possible as usual. Um, and then we would say, well, okay, we used Hartree Fock, but you can also use some maybe crude VQE or anything that gives you some overlap with the ground state. And then you, you apply the time evolution. Uh, L times also so a basis function L, you apply this, say, trotter, well, this time evolution L time on, on this initial state. And, and just to motivate, why is this a good basis? Because if you do the Taylor expansion of this thing, um, it's just one plus H basically, right? And, um, and the Krilov basis is exactly H on the phi zero. And, and as I said, the Krilov is a good basis. So there's some logic while, while using this is almost the same as constructing the Krilov basis I mean, hand wave. It does the same information, let's say like that. Um, um, so that's why people have used it in the past. And, and we also use it now. But, but then, as, as I said, we, we, this is the, the two ingredients, right? We want a scalable algorithm, that's time evolution, but we also want moderate, moderate depth. And the problem when you do this brute force 
you know, time evolution to the power of L, you need to do a lot of time steps until you reach your, your desired final time. And, and, but then that's why motivated us to play around with this. And essentially what we find works quite well in practice is this sort of two level multi-grid time evolution where you have big time steps and then a bunch of small time steps in the middle. Now, this will not give you an accurate trotter expansion because clearly if you make huge time steps, that's not, you know, you get, but, but, but the, the point here is we are just constructing a basis. We don't really care if it's exactly the trotter expansion. We're just constructing a basis. So our, our kind of intuition was, well, let's make huge steps. It probably doesn't matter too much in terms of the basis. So these long steps will capture the long time behavior of the oscillation, so the, the low frequency. And these, these uh, small time steps will still capture the very fine oscillations of the, of the wave function. That was the motivation. Um, question about this? Sure. Like may, maybe it's a problem of the, the drawing, but it's still, uh, the way it's drawn. Right. Like it seems here that you have like a series of small steps and then you include the other basis yes. factor. So it mm -hmm. seems uh, that it would be the same to jump like this, like this, and then to jump there. Um, no, because oh, then, okay. yes, that's, that's true. true. But, but then, then when we jump, jump here, we first do just a big step. And then, so, so if, if I, I want, want to come to this time, I have two, two trotter steps. If I would do brute force, I have one, two, three, four, five, six steps. Yeah. But now I do one big step. And, one, and if I want to come here, I do two big steps. But are, they, are these included in between the big yeah, steps? Yeah, yeah. So, so these are also included. Every one of these is a basis function. Okay. But, but the key is that, that if I want to construct a basis function for L equal to 10 or 15 or what it is, I don't need to do a depth 15 total expansion. I do a depth one, two, three. Okay. So, so I, I skip, you know, I would have to do a lot of small steps. Mm -hmm. This would be the exact solution, correct? I, I, I kind of jump in big, I do big steps and then. Um, so the drawing is actually the way we do it. Yeah, it's, it's, but you see, I can reach very big times with very few steps. And you can imagine you can put multiple grid, they can do a three level grid and so on eventually. Um, Uh, so, so I, I'm having a hard time understanding the philosophy mm -hmm. at the expense of more trotter error. Mm -hmm. You can go further in time and therefore your Krilov subspace mm -hmm. is kind of, um, it, it probes longer yes. times yes. and you don't really care that it makes trotter errors because at okay. some point you're going to diagonalize and... exactly. I mean, we care, right? But, uh, but there's a yeah. compromise, I suppose. Okay. Yes, exactly. Well, because you need any sort of time evolution in terms of free, free transform, say, you will have long wavelength and short wavelength. So in a sense, you need the right bits to get the long wavelength, right? Uh, and you need the small bits to get the short wavelength, right? So that, that's a compromise. I, um, I mean, we tried other methods, but this, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, multigrid, and then um, it, but I will show now how it works, but that was the philosophy as well. Um, so um, we, we, these are some results for the ground state now. Uh, it's again, the beta lattice, the same system like for the two side MFT, but now with more, we have uh, eight sides in this case, we, but this case, right now we did 20 and more, but just, it takes longer. So we, we, we for the paper, we put only eight. Um, and, and, and what we compare here is the total energy error of the ground state for two random DMFT steps, the first one, and then when we are at convergence. Um, and the first thing I want to point out is, yes, with this basis of the time evolution, it actually goes down the arrow below, whichever threshold you decide, it depends on what you want for your accuracy. Um, and um, which I think is important because that shows that the method with the whole basis function, that that actually works. Like it's not, not trivial to begin with, I guess, that with this sort of time evolution basis, you can get a nice ground. So, um, that's one thing. And the second one is we want to have moderate circuit. So the, the number of, trotter, well, it's NL is the number of trotter steps, right? Um, if you use this NK, so NK is the, in the previous slide, I mean, NK is how many intermediate, this would be NK one, two, three, for example. So with, with NK equal to three, um, you converge much faster. And, um, and also you converge better. And I think we, we tried it for many different, iterations and stuff. And this is the pattern that we usually observe. Um, that not only, because we just construct basis, right? So nobody tells you that 
that the basis with the extract exact trotter expansion is better than this one. In fact, usually we observe that we converge better with these cases. Um, so that shows the, that the method works and also that we can uh, reduce the circuit depth. And, and then I have just two more slides that uh, the Green's function itself, which is the final result, right, density of states. And we use two values of U, uh, two for a metallic state and eight insulating, because why? Metallic states are typically more complicated than insulating states. So this is a metallic state, this is the insulating state. And if you look at the top figure first, um, what I show here is the exact dose in, in dashed black line, which you can't see very well, I think. And then on top of it, the blue graph, which is our Krilov method. And as you see, they are basically on top of each other. So when I have a depth of 80 trotter steps, I get the essentially the exact solution, which is already much better, I would just emphasize, than if you just brute force time evolution. You would need much higher depths than this one. Um, that's the first thing, but, but then um, can we reduce it further? And while maybe 40 is still acceptable, maybe nine. So with nine trotter steps, you get, uh, you start to see deviations in the metallic state, not in the insulating state. Um, and so now we analyzed how, the, how this kind of multigrid method works. And um, so what we show here is as you, and L is the number of, trotter, of, of the trotter steps, so the, the big steps in a sense, or the, yeah. Um, so we go from 80 to seven to one to zero. Zero actually means that you, you have no red step, you just have the blue steps here. Um, and as you see, when you go from 80 even to seven, uh, the result is basically the same. And we are basically reduced the depth of the circuit by a factor of 10. So this circuit now literally needs only seven, well, eight trotter steps. And then you have to multiply by two or three, so it's about 20 maybe in total. Um, but you can also, I would argue, get away with only, with this, it depends how accurate your experimentalists want you to be, but this still captures more or less the features. Uh, when you do this zero actually means one trotter step, then you, I would argue, you start to see some deviations. But, but that means that for this system, I mean, we, basically we get reasonable accuracy with a total number of trotter steps of four to six. And I think that brings it closer to this regime where we say with moderate circuit depth, hopefully getting still accurate results. Um, and yeah, and that's fine. And that's the last result that I should say. Um, and so let me just uh, summarize. We, we have started by identifying the problem. We, we chose the Anderson impurity model because it's a tricky problem to solve. And what we put on the quantum computer is the Anderson impurity solver bit. And then I've shown two things. The first thing is that uh, we wanted something that runs on hardware, even if maybe it's not scalable. That was the Lehman representation of the Green's function. And also the MLD paper was using that approach. And then uh, we, we now work on scalability and I've shown you the Krilov methods, both with variation and quantum subspace expansion. And um, I mean, maybe just a note to conclude like there's no, I mean, when you scale up to more orbit, I, I think there's no way around that we need to go down with the noise. So I think, yeah, you can improve the algorithms to some extent, I think, but they all will require eventually lower noise levels than, 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 than maybe what is available now. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thanks very much. Right. Sure. Yeah. Open for questions. So yeah, uh, very nice talk. So uh, we actually looked into these DMFT Hamiltonians as well. So can you comment on how hard they are exactly? Because there's there's a sense that if you have an easy problem with not a lot of uh, degeneracies, you can solve this classically, right? Mm. And uh, um, yeah. Well, Dim, if you mean, well, the ones we considered here, obviously we can always solve classically still because- Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I don't mean- No, in general, In, in think, matters of yeah, size. I, think, I just mean in matters of yeah, natural yeah, yeah. orbital occupations. I, I think that it depends, you know, which method you use. There's many methods to solve DMFT mm -hmm. as well. And yes, you're right. You can use, say, approximation that worked here or there, but I think, it is a method that if you say ED for the general system, yes, it would scale, it's very difficult to solve. Now, whether this would scale exponentially, say with system size, but just to ED on a classic. But, but if, you, if you don't go to very strongly correlated systems. But these are strongly correlated, yeah. But, do you have proof of that? Uh, no, no, I mean, these so systems I, that I consider are examples, but, but I think in general, this is a method for strongly correlated systems. Yeah, but my, my so definitely the Anderson impurity can exactly. be strongly correlated, mm -hmm. but my point would be that none of the 
realistic systems have very high interaction strength. The ones that we considered in the examples. Yes. Uh, maybe, but but what we so, did in, in reality is that we, we we tested a method with random Hamiltonians essentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so actually uh, in this paper, with the KVK, we used random Hamiltonians, so we checked all possible reasonable values. So, so there's this paper by Cedric Weber, right, where he, where they do the cast step on a on a protein and mm -hmm. then identify yes. a, a yeah. tiny mm -hmm. DMFT mm -hmm. Hamiltonian, yeah. and there we see that none of the strengths sure, are. That, that's, uh, sure. yeah. Yes, but but uh, well, yes, but this is different because here we want to develop methods that are portable. So what what we did in the I didn't show the KVQA, I showed only one real material. But what did what we did in our actual simulations to test this, mm -hmm. we wanted to check does it only work here? And what we did actually is we changed the parameters across the. I mean, we we changed U in all the range where you think it can be reasonable, and it always works. I mean, the method itself, yeah, 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 work yeah for any definitely level. works. But then the, the question is, do you need it? Yeah, we will need it if there's a material that has strong correlations. So like the condo physics that I showed uh, the, well, I briefly mentioned at the beginning, we'll definitely need very likely a method like this. Okay. Thank you. I mean, that, that's the whole point of the MFT, right? That, that you want, um, that it's a, the Anderson impurity model, right? Whenever it's appropriate. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you for the talk. I mean, I've got a question about the uh, long those part. Mm -hmm. So long those, I mean, when you're using on classical computer, it's very sensitive to uh, the, the losing of the orthogonality of mm -hmm. your, mm -hmm. when you build your clear space. Mm -hmm. So here, do you have this problem? Uh, yes. Yes, that's and, a good uh, question. Yeah, I, th I think it's related to the noise uh, test. Also, you, you yes, ex that's exactly correct, yes. And that's why we needed to add error mitigation to overcome that problem. Say it again. Uh, uh, that is why we, we had to put error mitigation in to minimize the non-orthogonality, and then, and then we got the, the results at the end. Okay. So you need to minimize, yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so for, for the system we considered with the noise after 10, 10 to the minus three, we could still uh, got, get a good result. And how many, uh, what is the size of your clear space? How many vectors? 50 or so, I think. 50? Depending, depending on what, what, uh, uh, what system I think, yeah, we used because it's still a small system in a sense, and we could compute I think, all of it. Okay, yeah. And then I've got another question on the uh, last part. So, we, uh, what are you doing this um, uh, shorter expansion? So, it's mind me in this uh, short iterative long those propagation scheme in quantum dynamics mm -hmm. where they're using something similar, but. I really don't understand why you're doing this two multi-step things because uh, in long shows, I mean, you can get really large time steps. Mm -hmm. And then, so do you need the small time step for your uh, other calculation mm -hmm. or you can just keep skip them therefore? Um, well, this maybe we can discuss afterwards in more detail, but in this case, the answer is just yes, we need the small time steps because um, those give us the information again when you do the Fourier. In a sense, we don't do it in a sense the Fourier transform, but if you imagine about you want the features in your basis that capture the, the very fast oscillations. Okay. So we need those in, in our. Approach. So there, there are, I mean, in uh, those kind of uh, mm -hmm. propagator techniques, there are ways to get uh, intermediate, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, autocorrelation function mm -hmm. if you need something like mm -hmm. that in between your large time mm -hmm. states without uh, really propagated at the small time steps. So I'm I'm not mean, sure if it's, the fact it's very well known yeah, that yeah, you yeah. can get the uh, intermediate I'm still not sure if it's the same because this is to get the basis functions. So this, is, this, this gives you the basis functions of, of the, well, basically these phi L's of your, of your quantum subspace expansion. So I, I think what you refer to is actual time evolution probably. Yeah, but it can be, uh, yeah. That yes, that I agree. So that's what I think would be interesting to discuss. Yeah, I mean, we, we did, yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions from the remote? Um, just a comment about the loss of orthogonality of the Laxos. That's a problem for the eigenvalue problem. The Green's function is more related to a linear system solution. So you don't see it that much because basically you're, like when you diagonalize, you see the like this ghost uh, 
but basically they have zero oscillator they have zero pro projection on when you solve the linear system so you, you don't see them they're sort of there if you do the eigenvalues but not the lingering function maybe maybe it's an overstatement that we don't have the problem but but uh, i think uh basically it's not just your just we don't get the exact equilibrium states eventually obviously you have some errors that accumulate so i think we needed to get the errors small at the end of the day yeah so, thank you very much for with them here i think you take uh, not a random vector mm -hmm. is that influence because i guess for the grand state you need that is uh, the, the initial vector is not normal uh, no is have an overlap with the the same formation to me, then do you have a lot of uh, Yes, the initial vector I didn't show today makes a huge difference. And, and it's just if, if there's no overlap to the ground state, it's very difficult. And if it has, so we show when you do the, when you change U, you can see that it gets more and more different. I think for big U, because we start from the non interacting case, when you increase the U, the overlap goes down. And then, and then as you increase you, you, you need more iterations to get to the, but obviously what you will do there and eventually you can start from the opposite end for a big U solution. And uh, so the answer is yes, the, what you start with affects a lot how many steps you need. And because it's still some sort of uh, um, the base, I mean, if, if your initial state has no overlap with, with the actual ground set that you want to obtain, yeah, then you can't. Uh, May I ask? Also, I have a question about um, exact diagonalization for uh, the DMFT. I mean, at the beginning of DMFT, people rely on exact diagonalization, but at one point, I sure. found that it is far to be efficient compared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how many bus orbitals do you think you will need? Because it will be related to the, uh, mm -hmm. the quantum computer to get accurate the mft versus normal monte carlo yes. algorithm yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah I'm, 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 absolutely i mean it, it is an approximation which which is why i say the maximum localizer i can maybe may overcome some of that problem because it gives you more states um, i think there's no difference to any classical notion here that yes we, we are limited by the discrete size of the bath and um it's just like any classical system where every every you know Monte Carlo can can work in some regimes and some others, and this would not change that aspect that that you would use ED in the same systems where you would use ED say classical classical computing. Right now, I mean, like CTQMC works, but again, it doesn't work for all the regimes out of the box. That's, that's, so that's a bit how I see it. And, yeah, no, no, it's absolutely that's an advantage, but it doesn't. You know, again, it has its limitations that it can so. And ED may be an application there. Um, yes, the idea being that if once if you can scale the number of bad sites uh, more, then eventually the problem will will uh, be mitigated to some extent. But uh, but to but yeah, the problem in fact ED is is a is an approximation that we do here, and um, yeah, we would have to have a quantum computer with lots of qubits actually to test how it how it eventually works. Or one may start to add other corrections to this that that could be. Since, since we are running a bit late, I think I will ask a, a quick question, last question, but then we can uh, keep the discussion also after the, the second talk of this afternoon. So with, with the subspace uh, Krylov method, like mm -hmm. the one of the second part, there is no orthogonalization like in the traditional Langsos. Um, well, no, we, we still have it. Like it's just uh, done on a, there's still this bit here. I can do it classically. But it's, it's, you do a posteriori, mm, right? Because you just calculate the, the Hamiltonian effectively. Be, because this is equivalent to solve the generalized eigenvalue problem. Because it seems to me that mm -hmm. if you do not, mm -hmm. you get a very strong linear dependence in your basis. In your basis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you, and, you will get stuck at a certain point and well, you will not be able to keep iterating uh, sure. to converge. But that is why he, oops was one reason why we used the multi-grid method. As you see, this one doesn't improve anymore. So, so the multi-grid helps also on yeah, that side. Because you, you make okay. big steps. OK, that's fair. Because you then you, you make your basis more orthogonal eventually, right? Because you, 
I mean, again, intuitively, this is just you see, but that was the intuition behind it. Yes. Okay. So we observed this many times. That, in fact, the problem is when you reduce the time step. Yes, you get a better trotter expansion, but that doesn't mean you get a better basis. Exactly because of what you said, the basis. In fact, if you make the trotter step too small, what happens? This 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 happens earlier. Yeah, it happens really really fast. Well, right. if you make the trotter step big, you go keep going down, but it takes ages. So this is another uh, opt. But Right. Yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, we can uh, go for the coffee break, and maybe we can come back at. Uh, we're supposed to restart at three ten, maybe at three fifteen.